And joining us now on the debate in Washington, D.C., Franklin Four, author of How Soccer Explains the World. And here in studio, Pablo Idahosa, the graduate director of the Development Studies Program at York University, Francisco Rico Martinez of the FCJ Refugee Center, and James Sharman from the All Sports Television Station, The Score. Good to have everybody along for this very special World Cup edition of the agenda. I'm going to assume for argument's sake that there are a lot of people right now who are watching soccer uh, who watch it only once every four years because it's the World Cup, obviously. So I want to go around the horn for starters and get each of you to give me one idea as to why so many different societies and so many different cultures love this game. Uh, Franklin, okay, you think soccer explains the world. Let me start with you. Well, I could make the case for the game itself, but let me just explain something about the way in which soccer is organized that makes people so nuts for it, which is that if you start with soccer clubs around the world, they represent individual communities. So you go to a place like London, there are more than a dozen clubs. You go to a place like Sao Paulo, Brazil, you've got a club called Corinthians, which represents the people. You've got a club called Sao Paulo Football Club, which is the team of the elite. You've got Portuguesa, which is the team of the Portuguese. And you've got Palmeiras, which is the team of the Italians. So when these clubs play, they are proxies for your neighborhood. And that's very different than the way that sports are organized in North America, where teams tend to represent very broad cities or regions. And I think it transfers to the World Cup, where, where these teams are playing on behalf of your nation. They're proxies for your nation. And I think it's that when you, when you view your club or your team as representing you personally, it generates a whole other level of intensity, which is somewhat foreign to us in North America. Okay. Pablo, what do you say? I'd agree entirely with that. I do think that uh, football, soccer, has grown organically out of communities. And these communities actually are working, generally speaking, and that's a generalization, but they tend to be working class communities as well. They tend to be communities of ordinary people. And so that links in a way to an idea, as I've said, and many people have said, is it, that it's something that they can do. It's accessible. It's part of who they are. It's part of their identity. But it's also part of a, what I would call a kind of equality. And it's part of a, a community that both organizes itself collectively, but you also have the possi possibility for individualism and improvisation at the same time. James? Yeah, I think that tribalism mm. is so important. Mm. And uh, every four years, for sure, we see that, especially here in Canada. Um, but to make it even simpler, it's, it's the one sport in the world that we've all played at mm. some point. Every person in the world at some point has played football, soccer, even on the street with their friends, with their siblings, kicking the ball around. It's the simplest game to play. You can be bad at it or great, but you can play the game. And I think that, that relation to the game is, is what makes it so, so special. Francisco? I think you can play it everywhere. Uh, you can play it in, a, in the kitchen, in the garage, and, you know, in your shower. Uh, you know, in the in shower, a, for instance? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was the best goalie, you know, in the shower, only. Um, <laughs> I, and you play it in a, even if we, when you are in a in a party or drinking or everything could happen in, on the beach, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? There is the the beautiful game. That's why it is because you don't need to even be organized to play it. You you could be the most disorganized person, and you are still enjoying kicking the ball on the beach or wherever you are. In my opinion, you reflect that on the mm -hmm. on the team, and and also is because you have eleven. Uh, players. It's not that one guy is going to really kill the game and mm. destroy it and you know, no, you have to play as a team and, mm. and you see yourself playing in, in, as a community and you represent that in particular way. So for me, it's the, the easiest how simple is to play it, how cheap is to play soccer, mm -hmm. that you don't need any equipment whatsoever. You just need your imagination mm -hmm. and a two meters long space and you can do whatever, a magic thing. Apropos things. of your line about, about teamwork, I heard a line on the weekend, somebody said, there's no I in team, but, but there is when you say it in French, a keep, and we know what the French are going through right now. Uh, let's just play a, a little bit of tape here. We know that this is the first time that this magnificent tournament is taking place on the African continent, and there are a lot of people who are very proud about that. Roll tape, please. To be able to have something like this in our country shows that we are now also considered human and part of the global community, she says. 
I'm happy that we're hosting the World Cup, but I'm not happy about our living conditions. As you can see, we live in shacks, we don't have houses or electricity. People are suffering while the World Cup continues. The spirit is alive here as well, even though we don't see the matches and stuff. And everything is so live on television, so it's, it's awesome, it's nice. Hmm. Pablo, the significance of the first time in Africa, what do you think? It's significant for a lot of reasons. I think it's significant because it, uh, and it's purposely meant by FIFA to um, remove the image of Africa as a place of desperation, as a place of chaos, as a place of crisis. Um, and that's reflected in the choice of stadia, it's reflected in the images that are coming from South Africa, uh, who gets the feed and how we see what we see. Uh, you know, choice over stadiums, for example, there was a big debate in Cape Town as to where one stadium should be, and it had, had to do with the fact that if it was in one place, you'd see the shacks. If it was another place, you'd see this pan beauty of the mountains and of, of the, the beautiful scape of, of Cape Town. Um, but all that said, uh, you heard the contradictions in the, the responses uh, from uh, South Africans. There. On the one hand, they're enormously proud that this game is going to be this, this mega tournament is going to be held on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's, it's fallen short of the ambitions and hopes that many South Africans would have that this would bring some kind of development benefit, benefit to them. And that's in the nature, we have to say, of the political economy of mega events like the, like the World Cup itself. How important do you think, James, it is for the African esteem, if I can put it that way, that these World Cup games go well? I think it's very important, obviously. I mean, uh, as mentioned, there's the optics we're viewing this, this World Cup at and how we're viewing South Africa as well. And that's FIFA's number one goal. And, of course, the uh, South African government, too. How do we view Africa as a result of this, this tournament? And I think the organization is so, so very important because there's a lot of people out there waiting for this to fail. Yeah. And a lot of people are thinking that, you know, well, it wasn't ready for this. This is um, gone to Africa because Sepp Blatter, who's in charge of FIFA, wants it as his lasting legacy, that he brought the world's game to Africa. Is it ready? That's a question, but so far it's been, at least from what we've seen on TV and in the reports, very, very successful. It hasn't been sold out stadiums, perhaps, but that's, that's not strange or, or unique to any World Cup. Exactly. Um, but, you know, so far, so good. But, you know, what is the authenticity of what we're seeing on TV? How much of that is being tailored by the government and by FIFA? Um, if you follow FIFA, you know that they've got a, their own a unique way of doing things, shall we say. Well, let's follow up with Franklin, because, of course, I guess the Olympics and the World Cup can debate amongst the two of them which is the most the most important you know, international tournament. I don't and think there's much debate there. No. Oh, really? Go ahead, tell me, wh wh what do you think it is? No, I think that the, the World Cup is clearly uh, much more important simply because uh, there's, there's, there's much more emotional investment in the World Cup than there is in the Olympics. The Olympics tend to be very diffuse in the way that um, nationalism is channeled. That's because we are often rooting for individuals and individual achievement rather than this collective achievement, these, these Well, there's these five times as many countries, though, at the Olympics. Five times as many countries at the Olympics. Yeah, but it's about a medal count. It's not about winning a, winning, winning a tournament. You Go ahead, Franklin. Mm -hmm. Finish up. It's, and, and it's also the, um, the television audience is, is much larger for the World Cup than for the Olympics. Okay. You, you're, you are not taking in consideration that the whole world has participated in the qualifications exactly. of the mm -hmm. World Cup. Yeah. You are just seeing the 32, 32. tips and the yeah. end. Exactly. You have to follow up this for three years, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how the people get involved in the whole situation of passion and what is described okay. now. Well, tell me this, Francisco. Do you, do you think um, you know, there were a lot of questions asked before the Athens Olympic Games, you know, can the Greeks really do this? Mm -hmm. There were a lot of questions asked before the Beijing Olympic Games. You know, can the Chinese really do this? It was the first time that, that they held the games. Uh, they're asking those same kind of questions about Africa. Uh, how, what do the answers look like to you so far? Um, they are basically meeting the standards of the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. uh, put it that way. You know what I mean? They have brought the Western Hemisphere to Africa. And if you talk about that Western standards, they are meeting totally the standards in a particular way. But my problem is that this World Cup assigned to South Africa is a sign of a broken promise, the broken promise of humanity to the African continent. And every single st stadium that I see, for me, is a symbol of a broken promise because there is a symbol of a beautiful game, yeah. but in the other thing, the social issues and economic issues and historical issues are still right now in the same way than they were before. A broken promise by whom to whom? Um, by the Western Hemisphere to Africa, because we 
slave them, you know, we brought them to here, we make that poor. It's not that Africa was poor when they originally started living. It's the Western, the system that is making them poor. And now they are using it as a politically correctness as well from that perspective. So my concern is, it's a promise and it's happiness and it's beautiful, but it's a broken promise. We brought all this sadness because what is going to be there in South Africa after this game? 5% of all the investment for a national league? What about poverty? Let what me about try development? This, let me try this with Franklin. Um, you know, the, the, there are all sorts of plot lines in this tournament. And I guess one of them would be what happens when, if I can put it this way, the former colonial masters play their colonies. Like what happens when Portugal plays Brazil or what happens when, you know, Argentina you know, plays Spain or something like that. Uh, we'll, we'll does the uptick see. just I mean, happen? That's a <laughs> those are always the uh, the games that I'm most fascinated in. We've already had one of those where uh, the United, uh, United States played England, its former colonial master, and we'll have one later this week when Brazil plays Portugal and another one when Chile plays uh, Spain. And I, I always enjoy those matches because there is that um, great subtext uh, to them. Um, just to go back to this larger question about whether it's um, the, the context for this World Cup. Um, first, it should be said that Every country that hosts the World Cup does so in order to bolster its prestige and the legitimacy of its government. Mm -hmm. That's something that goes, that's true going back to the, the World Cup that Mussolini hosted in the 1930s. It's true um, going back to the World Cup that Germany hosted, which was very essential for Germany's, West Germany, for its reintegration into the community of nations after the war. It was true for the World Cup that Argentina hosted in 1978 when the country was controlled by a military junta that used the World Cup to bolster its prestige uh, domestically. And it's certainly true of this World Cup. You have a government in South Africa that, uh, it, that arose out of the shadows of apartheid and very much, and, and, and it very much wants to prove that uh, South Africa is a first world nation. And so I think there's, I, I think if you were to look at this as a matter of pure economics, the investment in the World Cup certainly wouldn't pay off. The, the, the economic uh, dividends from a World Cup are extremely fleeting. Mm -hmm. um, if you looked at it uh, as, a, as a matter of national prestige and of the psychological impact of a World Cup, that's something that's much more um, speculative and difficult to, to measure. I think that for the South African nation, the hope is, is that this, this, this sends a message to the rest of the world about its, its economic might and about its, its, uh, its image that transfers to some sort of long-term strength. Okay, let's try one more clip here. And this is, this is from, a, I guess this is from a friendly, right? This clip we're about to show right here, what, what the people in soccer call a friendly. It's an exhibition game, I guess you'd call it in North American sports. Uh, Brazil against Italy last year in the lead up to this. Roll tape, please. Novamente eu tenho no pitch, no controle da voz, no limite do pitch. A chapa no papel, no espécie formal, zero e onze e SP no dia de pé. Onde tudo acontece, é o curso do CRV, mas ali na frente tem que ter por CD. Now, James, at the risk of getting too political here, you've got one, you know, traditional G7, G8 country here right. going up against one of the emerging powerhouses in Brazil. And I wonder how important is it for the Brazilian sense of identity, not only to beat Italy, as they did in that game, but to beat them with such style. Star and panache. Yeah. The Brazilian way, right? The samba, the joga bonita, yeah. as, as they call it. Now, that's a bit of a myth. I mean, mm -hmm. Brazilian football it, it is wonderful. It's been the greatest brand of football for or for a long, long time. However, it's also a brand of football built on a real solid defensive foundation. Now, yes, they got the flair players, and I think that reflects the cultural uh, role in, in Brazil. They love celebration. They're a culture of dance and uh, you know, joy and happiness, and you do see that on the field compared to Italy, for example, or even England, which traditionally speaking, the style of play for them has been very uh, direct, very physical, get a result no matter what, stiff upper lip, compare that to the Brazilian way. So it does reflect the culture, um, but yeah, football in, in Brazil is everything. I mean, um, th there's been books written about it, how the public morale just increases with a good performance failure, and it's just uh, absolute disaster over there. Mm. <laughs> how about it, Francisco? 
Well, how many players have you seen playing with a smile in their face? <laughs> you know, I mean, the Brazilian players, uh, unbelievable. Ronaldinho, for instance, when everything that we touch the ball, you can see how he feel it. And I think that part of the, of the culture of the people going into a game, uh, I think is not a, a mere exercise of, uh, you know, I want to smile because the cameras are on me. It's the way that he had been playing the game since he was a little. And in my opinion, uh, the whole business-oriented kind of approach to soccer now, or football, um, have destroyed the beauty of the cultural going into the game. Because now Brazil has to play defense. You know, Brazil has to respect the standards of the European clubs in order to compete. Brazil has to change and modify the way that they play it in a particular way, which is good for the game, but it's not good for our culture, you know, because I really enjoy people laughing and enjoying in the game and not this as a work. Eight to nine? No. Okay. It's a game. Pablo, let me see if I can wrap up these two ideas that we've been talking about for the last few minutes in one question here. On the, on the one hand, the, the different cultures represented on the field in the way they play the game, the smiles of the Brazilian players. On the other hand, this idea of um, the, the colony defeating its erstwhile master is uh, pretty cool. And I'm not sure the U.S.-Britain game captures it because they're such great friends, those countries nowadays. But it, it would presumably it would be a huge deal for, um, I, not I, that this will ever happen, Algeria to beat France, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that I, would be I, huge. Yeah, I, I, I think it matters less. I think it matters less in the case of Latin America and, and Spain, and certainly in the case of the UK, and, or England, rather, and, 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 um, and the US. But in the former African colonies, it's much closer. We're talking about really 50 years ago. Uh, and we're still talking about relationships that, have, that are, are still there, powerfully economic relationships. Uh, where the, the United Kingdom, amongst other places, has, has, has supervened in many ways the economies of, of some of these cu countries over the last 15, 20 years, uh, as being a key player in structural adjustment programs, stabilization programs, and so on. But additionally, where, of course, a lot of these players play in some of these leagues as well. Uh, so you've got, you've got that connection. Um, on the other hand, I think we, t we call it the beautiful game, and it's a game at the, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's like talking about a friendly. It's, a, it's in the days when it was an amateur sport, and, and, yes. and people had these friendlies against each other. Really, there should be a different term. I think exhibition is probably better, but where a great deal of money is it's dependent upon it. So it's a game only in name only. Um, uh, so that's one part. But to get back to the question about um, it would be an enormous deal if Algeria beats France, and they could well do, um, but I doubt that either team is going to go through. One of the intriguing things about it, and this is where the game and the globalization, and I know um, Franklin has spoken well about this in his book, you look at Algeria, for example, and as many of you know, uh, the Algerians, uh, only two players actually come from Algerian clubs. The rest are either French-born and or play in France. And in fact, they're, they're French by nationality, uh, but be, because of the terrible things happening in Algeria, um, the, the, the Algerians uh, were allowed to take French-born born players. Well, let me follow yeah. up on that, because here's, here's what a historian at Michigan State University writes about this very thing that you're talking about. It must be Peter Olegi. Yeah? It's, you are yeah, right. Yeah, you yeah, got yeah, it. That's yeah, right. Peter Olegi. Yeah. European clubs own more than 80% of Africa's exactly. World Cup players. Final squad lists show that 112 of the 138 players are based in Europe and one in Asia, Qatar. Hmm. Nigeria's entire team yeah. is made up of players competing in nine different European countries. Hmm. So Franklin, how is the exchange of players and coaches in a globalized world affected the so-called national styles that each team brings to the, to the pitch? First of all, I think we should acknowledge that the soccer economy, the global soccer economy that you're describing is horribly exploitative. That you have, um, you have some players who make out well in it, like Didier Drogba, but then you have countless other nameless, faceless kids from Africa yeah. who get who get uh, enticed to go to Europe on uh, behalf of really dodgy agents who end up going to uh, the far reaches of, of of Europe, to Eastern Europe, to places like Moldova um, or to provincial France, and they just can't hack it. They've been overpromised by their agents, and 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 the agents have overpromised to them, and so you have several thousand um, African kids who are homeless, subject to child prostitution, who've been kind of thrown to the winds by the global soccer economy. Now, I think that you could say that on the whole, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's I think the, the 
um, globalization of soccer has actually improved the level of game. That the the game has always been a global phenomenon. It was it was it was it was there were balls that were taken overseas uh, by people who worked on the railroads in Argentina or um, students who took the ball from England to Switzerland. The game began as a global phenomenon, and so I think that the process of globalization is very much uh, part of the game's history. And I think it, it actually has had a, a relatively salutary effect on the game, that the English, you know, they're capable of playing um, short passing like a continental team, even though you wouldn't have seen it in this tournament. And uh, you, the Brazilians have, uh, you know, have, imp have, have learned defensive tactics from the Italians, which has uh, improved uh, their ability to win as well, and, is, and builds the foundation on which uh, uh, Robinho Kaká and Luis Fabiano practice their uh, beautiful craft. Okay, let me. You, you said something there that makes me want to follow up with James here. Uh, there is already this notion that Francisco talked about that the style of play that each country brings to bear somehow reflects the culture of their of their country. And Italy is a country that is magnificent, right? It is just so beautiful. It is romantic. It is all those things. <laughs> and yet the Italian team traditionally, generally plays a very stultifying, laid-back, defensive, not romantic, not kind of... I well, mean, that's explain your opinion, that. though. And if you, yeah. Italian, yeah. if you ask the Italian football hierarchy, yeah. that, that, then that is art. Yeah. That is beautiful. Exactly. The catenaccio, the yeah. keep the possession, mm. pick your spots, pick your spaces, attack rarely, mm. but when you attack, be clinical. And to them, that is art and that is beautiful to them compared to UK or Brazil but I think overall that the game's becoming so homogenized especially in Europe there's so many players from around the world playing on independent teams that you're losing that that identity I think with the country as you look at the Champions League for example which is Europe's uh, biggest tournament biggest teams best teams from around Europe play all together with players from around the globe the style of football is very similar from an English team to a Spanish team to an Italian team to a Ukrainian team it's getting closer and closer maybe 20 years ago it wasn't they're very distinct, but now with so many players and coaches too from different parts of the world in one continent, you're seeing this modernization of, of the global game, I think. And, uh, I, I, I would agree with that, and I would most definitely agree with James's characterization of the Italian game. I think it's, it's, it's an exaggeration to say that it's not pleasing to watch. In fact, when at its best, it's actually, it's got its own aesthetic, and it's, it's, the, the Italians have an economy of play, and technically they're second to none in many respects, right? They may not have the improvisatory characteristics of the Brazilians, but in other respects, they, they, they can be actually quite, quite, quite pleasant to watch. On the standardization of the game, it varies, and I think one of the things that one has to look at, for example, um, are, are the institutions within the countries themselves, right? So one thinks of the Dutch. The Dutch play all over the world, but when they go home, they play Dutch football. And if you watch them play, yes, they haven't broken out yet, but there's still that fluidity. There's still that one social touch. Football. There's still that social football, that total football. So there is still some distinctness about certain kinds of stuff, and they break out periodically. So one saw that in the game yesterday between Brazil and, and uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, you still see the Brazilian sensibilities and this Brazilian aesthetic come out, even when you've got that almost Mourinho-like defense that, uh, that uh, uh, their, their coach has instilled into them. So I think one needs to look at the, 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 the particular style. You rightly said, you could say it yourself about, about mm -hmm. what Mara's done to Argentina. Go ahead. And you know, the Italian soccer mm -hmm. is like a good wine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> that you enjoy, and you sip it, no? And you enjoy it. That's the counterattack of Italy. You have to enjoy that particular moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's very conservative, but you enjoy a good, a good wine. And, and in, in Brazil, you play the... Uh, the, the, the three, year, three days, you know, dancing on the street, the carnival, well, that's also going to the game, you know, the way that you move, the way that you spread yourself. But I want to say something about the, how the game is, is, uh, is losing their touch in terms of uh, being a game. Mm -hmm. Because for me, uh, now you are, the clubs are, are buying kids, 12 years old, 30 years old, and, and they own that kid and they bring it to Europe, and they start to train that kid. Look, look Messi. Messi from Italy, was, uh, from Argentina, was bought when he was 12 or something, and they start to do all the medical things. But now he's the best player in the world. He's the best player in the world. Uh, but my point is trafficking. You know, w when you stop being this uh, a business, and when this become an exploitation, when you remove the passport of that kid, when you buy the parents of that kid, you know what I mean? And, and you bring the, the child. When 
they go to places that where Messi haven't been there. You know, in Europe, there is nasty places where the, kill, the children doesn't have the respect of the best interest of their child James and don't have future. So my problem is that the game is destroying itself because it's applying the profit that is part of the system and killing the heart that we have all it's the time. Do you share it, that? It's, it's, a it's a business, unfortunately. And you w definitely, the, the game has lost a lot of its soul, I think, because exactly. of this. Now, there are rules in place trying to uh, you know, end these, these, uh, this exploitation. Um, however, um, clubs are, are they're smart. They find ways around it. Yeah, we can't go out and buy a kid, but we can offer his dad a lovely job and buy a lovely house for the family. Bring the whole family over. Don't mm -hmm. worry. We can't pay your 13-year-old your kid, but we'll take care of you. And that's the issue. That's where you know, it gets very, very murky. And I know UEFA with Michelle Platini in charge are trying to get to the bottom of this, but uh, I don't know what the solution is. I really don't. Well, in the case of Africa, I must say this, and this isn't, I'm not trying to exculpate or, or stop the blame for FIFA on many things, but one of the arguments around having games in South Africa was actually to uh, build up the infrastructure in South Africa so that South Africa could become a local hub for uh, African players. Uh, South Africa already is, of course, uh, a number of African players in, in this current World Cup before they went to Europe actually did play in South Africa and it's the only country probably outside of Egypt that has an actual fairly extensive infrastructure and it's, the, the argument is, I, I think the argument is going to fall but, short but of the why, practice. why they don't use the game to, you know, to play attention about HIV in South Africa, for instance? Well, Be, which, well, is, which is a very related situation. I because they're, 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 they're not going to do that because, again, it, it, it's going to... Re, it's going to construct an image of Africa as a place of being a problem. Uh, they I may do that. So. Out, they may they may do that outside of the image, but they, they've purposely kept out the problematic issues of, of Africa. They just want to put they on did, a happy they, face. They, 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 they want to put on a happy Although face. Although I think FIFA yeah. insists yeah, on the bids to, to show what would the legacy be, and there yeah. are uh, apparently um, um, uh, stuff going after the World Cup, for example, um, programs in place to to get more kids playing football, to legitimise yeah. the whole yeah. system as well, mm -hmm. get more fields built, more stadiums built, and, and FIFA do insist upon that. Now, whether it happens or not is the issue right it's now. Not happening. To get the bid, it's not, not happening. happening. Yeah, on paper it's me, there. But. Uh, Frank, let me try this with you. I'm going to read a quote here from a book called Soccernomics. Uh, sorry to bring up the competition here, but that's okay. You'll, you'll, you'll play with this a bit. Until the 1990s, the cliche in soccer was that an African country would soon win the World Cup. Everyone said it, from England's manager, Walter Winterbottom, to Pele. But it turned out not to be true mostly because, although African populations were growing, their incomes remained too low to import much good soccer experience. In the new world, distance no longer separates a country from the best soccer, only poverty does. I want you to comment on that, if you would, Franklin, from the standpoint of, and I'll, I'll use a sport that I guess I know better than soccer, and that's hockey. You need hundreds, if not thousands of dollars uh, as a hockey parent to really get into the system and to get, make your kid good, everything from skates to equipment, uh, you know, team jackets, the whole nine yards. Soccer is still, from what I hear around this table, completely the opposite. You need a ball and you need two feet and that's it. So why would poverty still be an issue? Well, I think it's not just poverty. I think a lot of it has to do with disorganization. You take a yeah, team yeah. like Cote d'Ivoire, yeah. where you have Sven Joran Eriksson, who's, <clears throat> I guess, a decent manager, although I wouldn't think his praise is too high comes in to coach the team in May. Yeah. Well, that's not enough time to build any sort of cohesion, to build, uh, to impose a tactical exactly. philosophy exactly. on a team. If you look at the Latin America teams, uh, you look at Paraguay, you look at Uruguay, you look at, um, you look, it, they've had coach Chile, they've had coaches who've been installed for many, many years, and they've had their players return time and again for qualification matches. And you simply don't have that with the African nations. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, you just can't win if you have a coach that comes in that late. And there's also, I mean, part of this goes back to the relationship with the clubs in Europe who are always very reluctant to let their African players leave to compete yeah. in African <clears throat> competitions or to train with their, their clubs back in Africa. So I don't think the issue is, is, is poverty so much. I think corruption comes into it with a lot of these local organizations, these, these national federations and um, the infrastructure in these countries, which is very much complicit with the dark parts of the global soccer economy. Um, but so I, I think it's I think African success is imminently achievable. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I have to say it's a top down um, problem. Let's yeah. so we got about three minutes to go here in Francisco. Let me do a quick follow up with you on this. You know, again, with baseball in Latin America, you get great, great baseball players coming out of Latin America out of object, abject poverty. 
Does that happen in soccer? Yes, happen. Look Honduras. Honduras is considered one of the poorest countries of the continent, mm -hmm. and now they are playing in the, uh, in the World Cup. But the friendly games, they didn't have a national teacher to exchange with the other hmm. uh, team. Why? Because they didn't receive the uniforms on time. Because they didn't have the basics of. And that's preparation. That's poverty. For me, poverty is not just corruption. Poverty is the whole situation about how we approach development. And the development has to do a lot with, you know, the game. You know, so, because Honduras is a classic example when they are using the national team to avoid the national crisis that they have last year when there was a coup against the government and, you know, and all the staff and election. Who is talking about that one now in Honduras? Nobody. You know what they are talking? Is that now Sunday will be Wednesday. Why? Yeah. Because they, this is the game of Honduras, and now Sundays will be Wednesday for a month. Okay. You know in what I mean? Last, That's the national division. In our last couple of minutes here, I want to get one answer from each of you on who you're cheering for, who you think's going to win, and why. Franklin, who are you cheering for, who do you think's really going to win, and why? Well, I'm, of course, cheering for the United States, but my, um, my favorite team outside of the United States in the tournament is Chile, who I'm rooting for on uh, feel-good humanitarian grounds uh, because of the earthquake there. But also, they have a wonderful coach named Marcelo Bielsa, who, is, who, who, who expounds on the, he's very eccentric, he expounds on the tactical, uh, the, the attacking style of football that uh, I think is so thrilling to watch. Um, I, you know, I, I like, um, I think watching Brazil play um, and the system where they have the uh, traditional Brazilian samba okay. soccer. I'm going to jump in because I want to make sure that we save time defense. for everybody on this, Franklin, and you'll be delighted to know, uh, of course, that Chile won earlier today, one to nothing. Uh, Pablo, yes. who's, uh, who are you cheering for? Who's going to win and why? I'm cheering for the African teams as, as usual. I, I like Algeria for what they did uh, just the other day, and also because of their circumstance. I, I like Ghana, but I think they're not going to go through because of, of the game against West Germany. Um, and I like Nigeria, but they're not going to go through either. Um, but if I had to pick a team to win, and I like New Zealand for what the, the <laughs> remarkable up, thing guys. they We're do. Not get but, to but, but fundamentally, I think Brazil are the strongest team, and I think they're the team to beat. Okay, mm -hmm. Francisco. Well, South America. I don't pick a team. <laughs> I pick a continent. I am from South America, and that's my reason. You know, I always enjoy when South America go against Europe, and we won. So you'd be happy with Brazil, you'd be happy with Argentina, you'd be happy with Chile. Anybody. Matter. Honduras would be the best, you know, <laughs> for me, because I am from El Salvador and we hug each other and we speak the same way, the Spanish and whatever. But South America, Latin America, that's the and way. Who to do you think is going to win? Brazil. Brazil. Okay. James, you got well, the last honestly, word. I, I must cheer for England, although they're the most unlikable team at the World Cup, perhaps, <laughs> um, outside the French, perhaps. Uh, but I have to because that's my heart. Um, I would love to see Ghana do well, uh, simply because they're the youngest team in the World Cup, two players over 24 years of age, under 20 world champions, beat Brazil yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. This is, if there's one African nation that's about to go to the next level, it's going to be Ghana. I hope it's this World Cup. I don't think it will be this World Cup, but by 2014 it might be. And I think, I'm still saying Spain will win it, but uh, Brazil are uh, looking pretty good right now. And which World Cup will Canada win? Uh, well, hopefully my kids will get to see it. Um, <laughs> let's qualify for the World Cup first, shall Let's we? qualify then, first. Then that's that's the good most plan. important thing. <laughs> Franklin Ford, it's good of you to join us on the line from Washington, D.C. He's you. the editor of The New Republic, author of How Soccer Explains the World. Pablo Idahosa from York University, Francisco Rico Martinez from FCJ Refugee Center, James Sharman on the other side of the table from The Score, and there's something about the British accent doing play-by-play -play for, for, for soccer, rather, that is just... We, we, we sound like we know what no, we're doing, but we don't really hear it Spanish. Yeah, man. you're right, you're right. Nobody <laughs> says oh, goal better than the Spanish announcers. That's true, too. Golazo, golazo, golazo. <laughs> okay, thanks, everybody.